So today we are um, going to cover John chapter 7 and also John chapter 8. So these will be the two chapters that we will focus on today. Um, you will notice a footnote in your Bibles, uh, you know, which refers to John chapter 7, verse 53, and then it goes on uh, up to John chapter 8, verse 11. And generally in the footnotes of your Bible, it will be given that this portion is not mentioned in some of the early manuscripts. Okay, so this is the story of the uh, adulteress who is brought to Jesus for judgment. Um, so we we've uh, briefly uh, you know touched upon this in one of our earlier sessions. We talked about how some of the very ancient manuscripts don't have uh, some portions. And so NIV and some of the other versions choose not to include these, uh, you know, um, in the main um, Bible uh, portion. And even if they do, they put it in italics to show that, uh, you know, this is not really there in some of the most ancient manuscripts. Um, however, um, there are many of the later manuscripts which have it. Uh, in these later manuscripts, this particular story is mentioned with asterisk marks, as though the person who was, you know, hand copying that wanted to uh, specify that this is not there in the most ancient manuscripts, but still it is of value. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, it is included. In some of the manuscripts, it is, it, uh, this particular story is mentioned after Luke 21:38. In some of the manuscripts, it's mentioned after John 21, 24. And in one particular case, it is in one particular manuscript, handwritten copy. They have found it mentioned after John 7, 36. So there's some kind of um, a little bit of confusion regarding the, the, the genuineness of this particular passage. Uh, but that should not really trouble us too much because the, the spiritual principles which we you know, see in this particular passage, we can find those spiritual principles even in other you know, uh, well-validated passages. So it's not that we are, you know, um, that this particular passage is telling us something which, uh, which contrasts uh, and, and, and which is contrary to the rest of scripture. So, whether you choose to believe this as part of the inspired scripture or not, it shouldn't really trouble us either way uh, because whatever is mentioned here, whatever spiritual principles are mentioned here, those things are also covered in other Bible passages. So let's actually look at this um, passage. If we could have someone read out for us, um, maybe we can start with John chapter 7, verse 53. And then in chapter 8, uh, if we could read out the first six verses. So from 753 up to uh, chapter 8, verse 6, if someone could read out for us. Verse 53, 753. And everyone went to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adul adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Yes. Um, so your version actually says that as though he did not hear. That actually brings out the meaning of what, uh, yeah, of what Jesus was doing. Uh, which version is that? NKJV. NKJV. Okay, that's good. That's that's very clear. All right. Uh, so we see that 
uh, you know the last day of the uh, feast of tabernacles is now finished after that everyone returns to their home but jesus goes to the mount of olives to spend time with the lord so he probably spent the entire night over there and you know maybe he must have slept on the mountain itself so now in the morning he comes to the temple courts to teach so a lot of people gather over there to listen to him teaching and so in that context where jesus is about to start his class okay so the class is about to start at that time uh, the the teachers of the law and the pharisees bring this lady and she has been caught red handed uh, you know in the act of adultery and uh, so they say to jesus according to the law of moses we are supposed to stone this lady so uh, shall we go ahead shall we kill her is what they are asking and uh, it you know it's clarified for us in verse 6 that they are not asking this question because they care about righteousness they are asking this question uh, because they want to trap him what kind of a trap are they laying for him if jesus were to say yes yes this lady should be stoned in in accordance with the law of moses then uh, because the romans have not given the jews the authority to you know give death sentences um, jesus would get into trouble on the other hand if jesus says no 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 we should not kill this person we should show her mercy then they can go and tell everyone saying ha see he doesn't obey the law of moses so uh, whatever jesus you know says um whether he agrees to the stoning or disagrees to the stoning they think that they can trap him and get him into trouble and uh, so when they bring up this question like it says in in the nkjv jesus continues to act as if he has not even heard and he continues doing what he was doing earlier he continues to write on the ground there's a lot of um, lot of theories which people make up about what he was writing on the ground they say that maybe he was writing down a list of all the sins uh, you know of the pharisees and the teachers who have brought um, the lady over there um, but then we generally do not see that anywhere in scripture where jesus openly publicly exposes people's you know sinfulness um, except in specific cases where he is you know addressing the pharisees Uh, so would he have you know started putting down a list of all their private sins for uh, everyone's perusal would he have done such a thing um the general i think the most simple explanation is that he has come over there at dawn to teach in the temple courts so he's getting ready for the class and the people also have now gathered over there so basically he's putting down on the ground all the things which he wants to share with them that day you know today what what does a teacher do when they come to the class on the white board they would write down the you know the bible verses the main points which they are going to be talking about during the class you know uh, so at that time they did not have white boards so basically what they would do this is something which they actually did they you know because um the parchments uh, you know and the papyrus were very expensive so you you can't exactly you know waste your parchment and papyrus uh, to just write down something for a lesson for a class so they would actually write on the ground the verses which they would be meditating upon that particular day they would write it on the ground they would you know inscribe it on the ground in the sand and uh, after the class you know it would just be wiped off so jesus was probably in the process of doing that when these you know people bring the lady and he just ignores them he continues writing whatever he was writing and uh, so they are not happy with his silence and so they pressurize him uh, you know into responding so in verse 7 and verse 8 this is what uh, it says if we could just have those two verses read out please verses 7 and 8 verse 7 so when they continued asking him he raised himself up and said to them he who is without sin among you let him throw a stone at her first and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground 
Okay, so he is not even interested in answering them because he knows that they are not genuine questioners. They are not questioning him because they want to know the answer. They are questioning him because they want to trap him. So he ignores them, but when they continue questioning him, this is his response. He says, let anyone who of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And just having said that one single sentence, he continues doing what he was doing earlier, continues to write on the ground, just ignoring them altogether. Uh, so um, what did he mean when he said, let anyone who is without sin be the first to throw a stone? Can anyone be completely without sin except for Jesus? I mean, haven't we all sinned in some way or the other? So what is Jesus referring to over here? Um, if you notice, a woman has been dragged over here who has been caught in the act of adultery. The act of adultery involves two persons. You would have to have a man and a woman together. But only the woman is brought. The man is not brought over here. So a suggestion which is made is that, you know, this was all a trap, right? So they would have actually hired a man to go to this lady uh, and, you know, uh, tempt her into getting into adultery. And so that man would be paid probably by these teachers of the law uh, to take part in this scam. So the man is not brought over here um, because if the man is brought over here and if he's cross-questioned, then the whole story will come out you know, of their conspiracy. So only the lady is brought over here. So here Jesus is probably saying, you know, he who is, you know, blameless, um, he who is actually a genuine witness, you know, to this uh crime which is supposed to have been committed, who is a, someone who is a genuine witness, you be the first one to throw the stone. And none of them can claim that because, you know, um, Jesus can say to them, where is the man? And if, uh, you know, they would have to answer that question, then their blamelessness would no longer be there because, you know, they would have to bear the blame and say, yes, we set you up for this particular, uh, you know, trap. So the suggestion made is that, and the verse to back up that is taken from Deuteronomy 19, verses 16 to 18, where it talks about malicious witnesses, those who are willing to give false witness, false testimony. Of course, in this particular case, uh, the um, witness would be true in saying that the adultery was happening, because that is true enough. But... Uh, the witness does not talk about how the adultery took place, who instigated whom, did the man approach, was he already being paid for this, all of that is not known. So in Deuteronomy 19, 16 to 18, it talks about how if the witness is, proves to be a liar or if he is proven to be someone who is... Um, yeah, yeah, someone who is deliberately, you know, um, setting up a scam, it says over there in Deuteronomy 19, verse 19, then do to the false witness as that witness intended to do to the other party. And then in verse 20 over there, it says in Deuteronomy 19, verse 20, the rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. So Jesus may be, what the suggestion is this, Jesus may be is telling them, if you are really a blameless, genuine witness of this crime which you are bringing before me, then because the crime has been committed, go ahead, raise the first stone and throw it at her. And if they do that, then they'll get into trouble with the Roman authorities. And if they don't do that, Jesus can turn the tables on them and say, ah, see, you are not respecting the law of Moses either. So the trap which they wanted to bring to Jesus to trap him, he puts it back upon them. And he says, fine, if you're that concerned about righteousness, if you are genuine in what you are saying about this crime, you be the first one to pick up the stone and throw. And none of them are willing to take that risk. So one by one, they all walk away until only the lady is left standing over there. And um, 
the Jesus speaks to her in verses 9 to 11. So if we could have someone read out for us, verses 9 to 11, please. Verse 9, then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up, and so no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So Jesus says to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your you know, life of sin. So the Lord never condemns. Um, condemning is done to crush the spirit of the person, to make them feel guilty and rotten, you know, like as if they are complete failures. So condemning is, is something which Satan does to crush a person and make them feel that they are a failure. What does God do? God convicts. So there's a great difference between convicting and condemning. Why does God convict a person of their sin? Because he wants them to be aware that what they have done is wrong. He wants them to admit that what they have done is sinful. Not so that they will feel like a failure and feel completely hopeless about themselves, but so that they can repent and come back to him and enjoy the benefits of repentance. So when he convicts, it is to make the person admit out from their own mouth that, yes, Lord, what I have done is wrong. But Lord, I now repent. I do not want to repeat this. So forgive me, Lord. I come back to you and I, I promise you that I will not you know, do this again. So he convicts to build up the person. On the other hand, Satan condemns so that he can make that person feel so crushed and defeated that they give up and, and you know, they say to themselves, oh yeah, I'll never change. I'll always be like this. He wants them to give up. So condemnation urges a person to give up hope of ever changing. Conviction is done just so that the person will realize and admit that they are sinning and they will be willing to repent and come back to the Lord and have a renewed relationship. So conviction is all about restoration. Condemnation, on the other hand, is all about destroying the future of the person. Um, so to use a, just uh, you know, a simple example, um, let us say that I uh, you know, have a very angry altercation with someone. You know, we exchange words. I say things which should not be said. The other person also says very angry things to me. And then we part company. And I go away feeling very justified because, you know, that other person was being rude. And so I, I feel I have every right uh, to have said the things which I did. I go away feeling very good about myself. But later when I'm having my quiet time, the Lord brings that to remembrance. And he says, did, what you did, was that right? Is that in line with my scripture? Is that the attitude which I have I know, asked you to adopt? And so at that time, when I'm sitting there in the Lord's presence, I feel convicted of the sin which I did. And then if I, if I have humble myself, I will be willing to admit and say to him, yes, Lord, it is true. The other person did provoke me, but I should not have responded the way I did, especially with the words which I used. So I would have to admit and say, Lord, what I did is sinful. And I would have to confess my sin, ask for his repentance, uh, ask for his forgiveness, sorry, ask for his forgiveness. And I would have to repent and make a promise not to repeat that kind of an attitude next time. On the other hand, if I allow Satan to you know, intervene in the situation and make me feel very condemned and hopeless and guilty, I will just go away saying to myself, oh yeah, I will never be able to gain control of my temper. I will always be like this. I will always be a failure. So that would be a wrong way to deal with what happened. So the right way would be to go to the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I do have a temper problem. But Lord, I'm coming to you. You're the one who can help me through your Holy Spirit. 
you're the one for whom nothing is impossible you will enable me through your grace you will cause me to overcome so you see uh, he convicts me so i will go to him and be restored and be full of hope but satan when we sin wants us to feel so rotten about ourselves that we actually give up altogether so uh, there's a right way to handle uh, sin and there's a wrong way to handle sin and in fact later when we go into the last few chapters and we look at the example of judas and we look at the example of peter both of whom betrayed jesus in their own way we we see uh, judas giving in to the whole condemnation and getting crushed crushed to an extent where he just goes and commits suicide on the other hand peter uh, when he is you know um, when he is feeling condemned the lord comes to him and the lord restores him we see that in the last chapter so he does not give in to that condemnation and his life is not destroyed rather you know the lord uh, restores him so um, it's very important how we approach sin because this is something that happens every day right i mean every day we end up doing something which we regret uh, the lord want never wants us to feel condemned he wants us to feel convicted and openly confess and say yes what i did is wrong and he wants to start the restoration process because through his holy spirit any sin can be overcome you can gain victory over any sin you know so nothing is impossible through him in him uh, so we need to have hope yes let's move on from there um john chapter 8 uh, maybe if we could read uh, verse 12 onwards um and we could go maybe all the way up to verse 18 yeah 12 to 18 john 8 12 to 18 please then jesus spoke to them again saying i am the light of the world he who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life then pharisees therefore said to him you were witness of yourself your witness is not true jesus answered and said to them even if i were witness of myself my witness is true for i know where i came from and where i am going but you do not know where i came from and where i am going you judge according to the flesh i judge no one and yet if i do judge my judgment is true for i am not alone but i am with the father who sent me it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true i am one who bears witness of myself and the father who sent me bears witness of me yes okay so here uh, jesus starts off with the words um, when jesus spoke again to the people he said i am the light of the world um if you look at the earlier passage at the end on the on the last day of the feast of tabernacles he said that uh, you know he can take away the thirst of anyone who comes to him over here he is saying that he will be their light these are the two main things uh, you know uh, which were focused upon water and light during the feast of the tabernacle when the feast of the tabernacle was going on every day they would pour out water on the altar why it's like a reminder to them of how god provided water for them in the wilderness you know when they were going through the wilderness so jesus at the, on the last day of the feast he says you know i am the living waters so yes your ancestors received physical water but if you come to me i will give you spiritual waters which will take away your thirst now jesus is touching upon the second aspect which is generally highlighted in the feast of the tabernacle where on the last day of the feast they would light up these huge large uh, you know um menorahs you know menorahs are those um, candlesticks with many many uh, you know um it's not just one candlestick it is uh, it is basically what in english i think they call it a candelabra or something yeah yeah you know so it will have many many uh, stems um so uh, they would light up uh, they would light up two of those large menorahs uh, which are 75 feet in height uh, so those were lit up on the last day of the feast so 
Jesus, first of all, referred to the water and he said, I am the one who can quench your thirst. Now over here, he says, I am the light. You know, back then, uh, when they were in the wilderness, it was the, uh, the, the pillar of light which lit up their pathway during the night. But now Jesus says, I am the one who has come to give you light. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. So back then in the in the history of you know Israel, when the pillar of light used to light up their path, what was that pillar of light basically doing? It was showing them the right direction. In the darkness, they would have ended up going somewhere else. But because they had the light, pillar of light leading them, it helped them to go in the right direction. So now Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. If you were to follow me, I can take your life in the right direction. Otherwise, in the darkness, you'll end up going in, in the wrong direction. You'll end up making all the wrong decisions. And then, you know, your life would be destroyed. So he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Your, your, your life will be a living life. You know, it will be full of light and you will... Uh, move in the direction of blessings rather than in the direction of you know destruction so that's the promise which he is making so when we think of jesus as the light of life um in what way would that apply to us he's the one just like that pillar of light you know in the old testament he is the one who lights up the path in front of us we are supposed to go to him and consult him before we take any decisions, before we make any choices. So he is the one who should be lighting up our everyday decisions. If we do, if we take up those decisions on our own, in our own strength, we may end up going in the wrong way because we are stumbling around in the darkness without having consulted him. On the other hand, we should be people of light who are following this light of life when we follow him and we consult him before we take our life decisions, he makes sure that we are headed in the right direction, going down the right path. Okay, so a lot of believers do not, uh, they know that Jesus is the light of life, but they don't really go to him for consultation. They take their own decisions and when things become a mess, they say, oh, look what God has done to me and my family. But did God really do that to your family or was it your own wrong decisions which you know caused you to end up over there? So we are supposed to be following the light of life and he will guide us and he will take us in the right direction. All right. Um, maybe now we can get into verses 13 to 20. Because, uh, yeah, in these verses... Um, you know, um, the Pharisees say to him, yeah, you're saying all these nice things, you know, but you're saying it all, you know, in your own strength. Uh, but Jesus says, no, these are not my words. These are the words of my father who has sent me. What he has told me to tell, that is what I'm conveying to all of you. So I'm not just, you know, witnessing in my own uh, strength. Someone else is also giving a testimony and my father is the one who is witnessing about me. Okay, so we read these verses already, right? Uh, so in these verses, this is what we see. The Pharisees challenge him and they say, you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. And then Jesus replies and he says in verse 18, I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the father who sent me. Now, do you remember this? This is something which we talked about. We talked about how Jesus has got four witnesses testifying about him. We saw that in John chapter 5. And the four witnesses which are mentioned over there, the first is John the Baptist. The second is the, is the, is the miracles which Jesus is doing. He says, these works which I am doing, they testify about me, that I am indeed the Messiah. The third witness, he says, is the father who, you know, proclaimed at the time of baptism, saying that this is my son in whom I am well pleased. 
So that would be the third testimony. And the fourth one, he says, uh, is what Moses has written. He says, Moses, all that he wrote, it, no, it, it, it testifies about me. So Jesus, earlier in chapter 5, talked about four witnesses which are testifying to his messiahship, which are testifying to his divinity. And uh, uh, so now here in this chapter 8, he again you know, brings up this point and he says that the father is testifying about me. So then they ask a rather insulting question. That would be in verses 19 and 20. If someone could actually read out that, verses 19 and 20. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered you, No, either me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. This word Jesus speak, spoke in the treasury as the thought in the temple. And no one laid hands on him, for his honor had not yet come. Okay. Um, uh, they ask him pointedly, where is your father? You know, Jesus says, the, my father is witnessing. And they know he's talking about the heavenly father. They're very, you know, they, they have understood that. But still, they say, ha, where is your father? Because they're talking about how, you know, uh, his mother conceived him uh, without having known a man. And they don't really believe that. So they believe that you know uh, Mary uh, was involved in some kind of a illegitimate relationship, and that's basically how Jesus was born as an illegitimate child. And so they are actually implying that they are mocking him, they are insulting him, and they say. Then they asked him, "Where is your father?" But Jesus, you know, he says, "You do not know me or my father." So if you had believed in me, if you had really trusted in me, then I would have revealed the father to you and then you would have known even the father. Because that's, uh, you know, that's what Philip uh, um, will say in one of the future chapters in John, John chapter 14. You know, he says, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. And at that time, Jesus says to him, you know, if you, if you know me, then you know the father because I and the father are one. Uh, so... Jesus says over here to these people who are asking him, where is your father? He replies to them and he says, uh, if you knew me, you know, if you really believed in me, you would automatically know even the father as well. But because you are refusing to believe in me, even though there are so many witnesses pointing towards me, in your, because you're not believing in me, therefore you do not know my father, is what Jesus replies back to them. Um, and then he repeats something which he had mentioned earlier in verses 21 to 24. Uh, yeah, if, if someone could read out that, 21 to 24. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and will die in you, in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you, that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. This also is a repetition, because you see we are in the previous chapter, last class, when we were covering the portion where he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And then what, is the, uh, what do the people say to each other at that time? They ask, oh, will he go into the Greek lands? Is he going to go and start preaching to them? Is that the reason why we cannot go where he is going? You know, that's, the, that's what they say to each other in the previous chapter. And here, the Jews say, say to each other, why is he saying that we cannot go where he is going? Is he going to kill himself? You know, so uh, they are kind of, you know, mocking uh, over here. Uh, because someone who kills themselves... You know, in their um, in their culture, I mean, they believed that a person who commits suicide would be uh, sent to the lowest level of hades. Okay, so uh, they basically, uh, you know, is asking in a very insulting manner: Is he going to kill himself? Is that the reason why we cannot follow him? Um, 
but then you know jesus ignores their remark and he continues and he says you are from below i am from above so basically he is saying i am going to go back to the father who sent me and at that time it will be too late for you you know to change uh, your ways so he says i told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that i am um you will indeed die in your sins um so over here in your in your english translation it says if you do not believe that i am he but actually if you look at the greek he just literally says that i am you know he's using that divine term i am so he says you need to believe that i am the divine i am if you do not you will die in your sins because i am not a human being who's talking about myself i am from the father and i will actually go back over there now we have at least seen three different repetitions you know in this chapter already why does jesus go on repeating these things or rather when john when he's recording these things why does he keep repeating the same concepts and ideas um there was this comment which i had seen in uh, you know quora you know someone had posted over there they had said uh, i am reading the book of john and uh, john keeps repeating the same thing again and again it's so boring you know it's what that person had written and then uh, some people had given advice saying you know maybe you should pray before you read because then maybe you know you will you will be able to read with more interest and there were different things which different people said but the reason that repetition was done by john and by the other writers is because that's the way the writing style was in those days anything that was considered an important idea or an important concept would be repeated at least 3 to 4 times in that writing so when you come across a repetition in these biblical books the question which you should ask yourself is why is this particular thing being repeated what is the significance of this particular idea or concept that is making john write it again a second time is there some significance is there some importance so just to take this you know example about how jesus again repeats where i am going you will not be able to come why is that idea being repeated again in the next chapter because john and jesus are trying to bring out the urgency of the limited time available to these people to place their faith in him you see nicodemus was a wise man he comes to jesus while jesus is still available physically he clarifies his doubts and he places his faith in him these people on the other hand instead of you know thinking carefully about what jesus is saying and then coming to him and asking their doubts and getting clarification they are delaying again and again and jesus is saying i'm going to be here for only a short time now is the chance for you to come to me like nicodemus did and find out what is true but instead you're wasting the days and i'm going to go away and once I, i'm gone you'll not be able to come where i'm going and in fact eternally forever and ever you'll never be able to come where i'm going because you know you're not going to be part of the kingdom so this idea over here is being repeated to convey the urgency of what jesus is trying to say so the readers of john you know the first readers of this gospel the the very first people who would have read this gospel once it was written down they would have caught the urgency of what is being told you know over here john is recording these words to show that he is available for a limited time and if they don't place their faith in him while he is still available you know there would be no future hope for them so um another thing about that you know comment in the quora about how the gospel of john is so boring because of all the repetitions people say that you know a new believer should start with the gospel of john i am not sure actually who started off that piece of advice but have you noticed john is so deeply theological the very first opening verse no john 1 1 itself contains such deep theology expecting a believer a new believer a brand new believer to start off with the book of uh, gospel of john may not be such good advice on the other hand 
Look at the Gospel of Luke. Luke is writing to Theophilus, who is a seeker. He's someone who ha has heard about Jesus, is very interested in knowing more about him, wants to place his faith in Jesus. So Luke says, I mean, I'm writing to a very simple, clear account so that you will read and get to know that this Jesus is real and you will realize that he is divine and you'll place your faith in him. That's the reason why I'm writing down this entire account is what Luke says. So maybe a new believer should actually start off with Luke. And then maybe they can move into Matthew and Mark, which, you know, which are very, very similar in content. And then maybe once they are kind of more familiar with what Jesus says and is, you know, the, the, the teachings, or, you know, which he conveys to the people, once they have kind of caught what Jesus is saying, then maybe if they come to the Gospel of John, what Jesus is saying over here will maybe make more sense to them. You know, that's just a um, uh, side thought on the subject of the Gospel of John being repetitive and being very deep in its theology. So anyway, um, moving on from there uh, into verses 25 to 30. Yeah, if someone could read out verses 25 to 30. Verse 25. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They do not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, I am He, and what I do, nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that pleases Him. As He spoke these words, many believed in Him. Okay. If you go back to the beginning of this whole conversation, this whole conversation started when the Pharisees said, you're testifying about yourself. You, you, you yourself are your own witness. That doesn't carry much, you know, uh, uh, authority. You should be having someone else to testify about you. So that is how the whole conversation started. At which point of time, Jesus says to them, I do have a witness, the Father, the Heavenly Father, the one who is in heaven, the one who has sent me, he is the one who is testifying about me. But they are failing to grasp this very basic concept. They are refusing to believe that he is from above, that he is divine. And uh, so again, they ask this question, who are you? They asked. And Jesus says, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. And uh, so he says, you know, maybe you will believe me when I am lifted up in verse 28. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the father has taught me. So this whole idea of being lifted up, that also is a repetition. Where did we come across that earlier? That was in the conversation with Nicodemus, where, you know, in, in John chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, this is what John, Jesus says over there. He says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So in um, John chapter 3, Jesus compares himself to the snake, the bronze snake which was placed in the wilderness. And in the same way, the curse was placed upon the bronze snake. Jesus, you know, was saying that the curse will be placed upon me. You know, the curse which is supposed to come on humans, it will, if it will instead be placed upon me, so that anyone who believes in me will have eternal life. So that was the emphasis which Jesus brings out when he was talking to Nicodemus. Over here, he says. You guys are not believing that I am from above, that I am from the Father. But when you see the Son of Man lifted up, then you will know that I am He. So over here is not talking about the lifting up, which is talked about in John chapter 3. There it's talking about the lifting up on the cross. Because there he is comparing himself with the cursed snake. 
in the same way that the, the, the snake was lifted up and the curse was placed upon it, Jesus too, he will be lifted up on the cross and the curse of all the people which should come upon the people will be placed upon him. Here, he's talking about another lifting up. He's talking about how he will literally be lifted up in front of their eyes into heaven. And at that time, they will have to believe that he came from above and he's going back to where he came from. And then they will have to admit that, yes, the message which he was conveying was divine. It was from the father. You know, so he again, this too has been mentioned earlier because, you know, in um, John chapter six, is where uh, we saw that when uh, in John chapter 6 verses 61 and 62 aware that his disciples were grumbling about this Jesus said to them does this offend you then what if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before so all of these things are being repeated again and again to drill into the brains of the readers that all the things being written over here in this gospel of John they are a message directly from above, from heaven. They are not the words of some human. These are words of life and spirit being given to the people so that they can place their faith in him. Because if they place their faith in him, he will be their light. He will light up their path, their future. He will be their water. He will quench their thirst. He will be their bread to an extent where they are sat satisfied in their lives so there's much hope being offered and so these things are repeated again and again and he says i will prove to you that i am from above on the day when i actually you know literally float into heaven back so and that that's what we see right uh, even as the disciples and the other people are watching he's literally lifted off the ground and he ascends back into heaven from where he came uh, so um, so when he's saying all of this, it says in verse 30, even as he spoke, many believed in him. So now it's kind of getting through into some of their minds. And it says over here, even as he spoke, many believed in him. But what kind of a believing is this? We will see that in the next few verses, because the next set of dialogue begins. And there he is talking to the specifically to the people who said that they now believe in him. Okay, so we'll discuss that when we come back from the break. Thank you.